do have a choir. We had actually a bunch of folks, and they chickened out over time. And Rachel and David, have, and really Bruce, but Bruce is not feeling well, so he, they really uh, have uh, uh, kind of stepped up and uh, take due. But uh, we have, um, if you're interested in singing in the choir and stuff, then you, you can, okay? Uh, just see David. He'll let you know. All right. We can make room. Romans 16, if you will. All right. Romans 16. We're going to look this morning at the issue of spiritual maturity. And uh, we'll, we're going to look at it here. Uh, we started a couple weeks ago talking about no wimpy believers. And uh, I did that, and I got a couple of emails. Hey, that's a neat title. <laughs> and I... Well, what about the message? I haven't listened to the message yet, you know. So, but uh, anyway, so as we do in the summertime, it gets warm and people travel and come and go. We, I try to tend to pick really non-topical series things. So if you miss something, you're not missing, you know, a, 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 a integral component. But in saying and doing that, I usually then don't do that. So that's the goal, okay, and uh, so forth. But in Romans 16, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. Our apostle Paul has set up and was given to him a system of edification, a design of godly edification. It starts in the bottom with my gospel and that issue of my gospel and the issue of grace. And as you begin to take in Romans and as you begin to lay in the foundation and as you begin to, to come in and, and, and get that foundation of grace laid, what then begins to happen then is then you begin to build on that foundation about the mystery and the, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And that begins to then talk about the goal. Why, what is God doing today? Why is God doing what God's doing today? Well, you know, what's He doing? Why is He doing it? And we begin to, to study that and to look at it. And then we begin to build on that issue there then about the scriptures of the prophets, and that then becomes the issue of glory. And as we were, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and we spent an hour doing it, and as we begin to move, then what begins to happen is, is you, the Paul wants you to become mature. He wants you to grow, and he wants you to grow up. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and I just want to spend this morning talking to you about the issue of spiritual maturity and what makes those mar what marks spiritual maturity, what makes up spiritual maturity. Because everyone in the room grows at different paces and at different, some, you know, some, have, have you, are you guys able to hear me back there? Okay, all right, good. Um, I'm in, in the quiet room. You, you guys in here, I don't care about. Those guys back there, we got to worry about, okay? But the thing is, is, you know, you, if, if you've ever had children and you raise children, and you got that one kid who's, a, who's the winner and just takes off and learns everything and sucks everything up in his gut, and then you got that other one going, well, when they get done, I'll, I'll get there one day, you know? I got a one like that, you know? We'll get there. I got one that takes off, and one in the middle that just says, eh, eh he, he's blazing a trail, we'll follow later. But, Everyone moves at a different pace, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, he says in verse, uh, well, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Look over at chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. The Corinthians were not able to handle 
the, the next level of information. They were stuck right here about the cross. Paul wanted to move them and talk to them about the minions never let you down. The church, okay? He, he's like, I want to move you. I want to, chapter 2 there, verse 6, I want to talk to you about some, perf, some mature stuff. The Corinthians were, were here. He calls them babes. I want to move you on to some maturity, to some adulthood. By the way, Thessalonians will talk about the Lord's coming, right? So when you, he wants to move them. Now, come over with me to 1 Corinthians 13. He then spends the first six chapters in Corinthians rebuking them. What do you do with children? You rebuke them. You correct them. You cause them to start growing up. You hope. <laughs> you know, you lay in the rules. Here it is. And then in chapter 7 to the end of the book, he answers their questions. Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things that you wrote to me. But in there, in 1 Corinthians 13, and in verse number 13, at the end of this great dissertation of what charity looks like. Now, charity is not love. I know we've been told it's love, but charity is love in action. Charity is an action thing. It's not a, oh, dude, I love you. And then don't do anything. Charity is, I'm doing this because I do love you, and I do have the love of Christ, and I am motivated properly. Follow that? We're going to do a message here probably next month about charity is not love, because you get that all the time, and you got to understand charity in Scripture. By the way, charity in Scripture has nothing to do with feeding the poor. If you, okay, look down at, you're in chapter 13, look up at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. See, feeding the poor has nothing to do with charity. Now, out in the world, it has all to do with charity. But in Scripture, where you're going to be taught and understand... Verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, and charity. The, these three, the greatest of these is charity. So just as Paul has this edification process for you to start as a babe and to work up into adulthood, he's also going to follow the marks of maturity because the first one is faith. Faith, resting in the foundation of the Word of God. Then we have charity. The source, uh, and then we have hope. Let's get hope up there. Okay? So you begin to have the three begin to work out. You you, you got that? Now, by the way, the reason I'm going quick is in about half hour, it's going to get really warm in this room. Okay, so I'm trying to motor through some things quickly with you, all right? Um, we're having some issues with the AC and so forth, and they're on, the, they're on it. They're trying, we're trying to figure it out, but I just want to move with you. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Faith, the three marks of maturity, faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity. You would, you could, you would, Paul's going to tell you in, 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 in Galatians, it's love that worketh. So you can use the word love for charity. Just understand we're not talking about that mushy, feely, you know, smoochy, smoochy thing or the brotherly love. We're talking about love in action. Hope, God's word set before us a hope, something he's accomplishing. And then charity, the source of all of it working in your life. And what begins to happen is, you got 1 Thessalonians 1, look at verse 3. Here it is. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. See how you got all three there? The, Thessal- the church at Thessalonica was designed, is said to be a model church. Now, they're not a perfect church. They've got issues. They, Paul's going to address them and so forth. But that model church, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, what are, what are they? They have a work of faith. 
a labor of love, and a patience of hope. You want to see it transpire, look over at verse 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak. Look at that labor of faith. What are they out there doing? They're not sitting there going, no, you're going to tell nobody. Shh, quiet. They're out there getting the word out, spreading it out in their community. Then there, verse 9 for they themselves show of us what manner of entering we had, how ye turn to God from idols. You turn to God. There's their faith on display. What did they say? We don't want the idols. We want the living God now. We don't, we don't need that religious nonsense. We want the true, the true living God and His grace and His message to us. Then he says, you turn from the idols to do what? Serve the living and true God. There's, there's their love in action. There's their charity. There's the labor of love. And then what are they doing in verse 10? There's their hope. They're waiting. And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. You see the hope there? Oh, that patience of hope. They're in the moment. They're, they're working away. They're laboring. They're, they're, they got this work of faith. They got this labor of love, and they got this patience of hope. You think about faith. Romans 10, verse 17, he says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God, the message to you and I today is, Gentiles, from the Apostle Paul. What then does that begin to produce in you? It begins to produce a hope, doesn't it? A hope to, to, that, that's going to carry us into charity. An application of the Word there. An application of taking the Word of God and now going and putting it into action. The work of faith. The Word of God empowering you, empowering your life because you believe it. Look over at chapter 2 here of 1 Thessalonians. Look at verse 13. These three items, faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love, these three produce spiritual maturity in the life of a believer. That's the design. It produces the proper thinking process in your life, which is then designed to produce some maturity in your life so that when you go live life, guess what? You're living life victorious and having victory. It starts with faith. It starts with taking the Word of God and just simply believing the Word of God to you. Chapter 2, verse 13, notice carefully. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that, what? Believes. If you don't believe the word, you know what it is? It's just words. It, but you, you take the word of God and you believe it, and what's it going to do? It's going to effectually work in you that believe. We have the Word. We know the Word. We, we have it. It's right here. We just got to believe it. And boy, that is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> you know? But we have to trust it. That, that faith then moves. That, that belief in the Word of God then brings in... Boy, can, let me ask you something. How wonderful is it to know that Christ died for your sins? Boy, isn't that wonderful? Look over at 2 Corinthians 5. Hold on to Thessalonians. Boy, I tell you what, if that doesn't thrill your soul, we sang that song, Beulah Lamb, but we changed the word in Christ alone. Boy, if that doesn't just thrill your soul, you're, I, then we, there's something wrong with you. Because the thrill of just simply knowing that you have total forgiveness 
that no matter how bad you mess up, and some of you lay stinkers, oh man, the fact that he died and he, boy, that alone... And then you come over and you begin to understand what he's doing in the church, the body of Christ, in the heavenly places. And boy, you begin to comprehend that. And all of a sudden, you're just like, boy, that's good, but this is better. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because why does the love of Christ come up, put his big old bare arms around you, and carry you away? Because we thus judge. We think a certain way. Judgment, discernment. This past week, the Supreme Court laid down some judgments, didn't it? If you paid attention to what's going on around you. And you know what they did? They said, this is what it is now. Or, nope, we're going to go back over here and it's going to be this. They did what? They made a judgment. They discernment. You're going to think about this. Because we thus judge. We think this way, don't we? That... If one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live. See the two classes of people? The dead people and the live people. Man, if you're in the live people, what do you understand? That he died for you, didn't he? Well, thank you, Jesus. No, man, yeah, let's get on with it. A little shouting match. Come on, you know. Sometimes I think we, oh, we can't do that. Oh, it's, it's, sometimes I just want to be, yeah, we can do it. Come on. Why? Because look at how you think about this. He sh- that, that, verse 15, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see, folks, faith, the Word of God comes in and it begins to empower your life when you believe that which then leads to that labor of love. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 1. When you begin to believe that, it begins to motivate you. And your life begins to be motivated out of a life of gratitude, of an understanding for what He's done for you. And when you understand what He's done for you, you have gratitude and you are thankful. Remember that thing in Romans 1 about the heathen? Then they were not thankful. Boy, you're in 1 Thessalonians. Look, look over, well, look at verse 3. Then that labor of love, that life motivated by gratitude, produces a life sustained by the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When you talk about motivation by being great, grateful and thankful, and then you talk about a life sustained by the hope that we have in Christ, that brings to mind Titus chapter 2, doesn't it? Ch- Titus chapter 2. You see, folks, maturity, just growing up a little bit, is an interesting thing. Paul laid it out. Hey, this is Romans 16, 25. You got the foundation. We're going to build on it. We're going to move you up in some understanding from being a babe in Christ to being an adult. By the way, by the time you get done with Romans 16, you are to be an adult. You're not to be waiting till you get into these other things, other groups, because, where's my minions? All right, this is Romans, Okay. When you get into the book of Ephesians and upward, he's assuming you are mature. Now, what about Corinthians and Galatians? Well, what were the Corinthians? They were babies. How do we deal with babies? We got to do this. I'll show you. What did I tell you? Titus 2? Can we do a little rabbit trail real quick? I'm not on one. I'm on my third sheet of notes up here. But I didn't get to the first two. So, shh. Okay. Look. Look, <laughs> look over. At, that's a joke, folks. Okay. And not really, but it is. I'm not even in my notes today. 
I, they're just up here as a crutch. Look at Philippians 3. I'm sorry, Philippians. Look at Philippians. Oh, shoot. Well, look at Philippians 2. Well, you could, any passage in Philippians will work. But. Look at Philippians 1. Look at verse 26. We'll start there. What did he say to the Corinthians? We read it a minute ago. 1 Corinthians 3. You're carnal. You're babes. You're not going to get the, the big meat. I got to keep you down here in the grace and the cross message, right? So you take a baby, and what do you do with the baby? You discipline a baby, don't you? You spank the baby. You, you, put, you teach the baby. You, you have uh, timeouts, and you have discipline, and you got structure, right? But what happens when they get bigger than you? And you can't bend them over your knee anymore. Or you've released them to their adulthood. Now what? Now here's Philippians. Because Philippians is a book of reproof. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul prays for him. I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are more excellent, that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ and the glory and the praise of God. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have a falling out, rather, unto the furtherance of the gospel. They're mature people. That when he prays for their love to abound more and more and more, and in judgment, he's not over here teach, trying to talk to them like little children. He's talking to adults in Philippians. Now, how do you talk to adults? How do you rebuke adults? Come over here, get up, bend you over my knee, and I'm going to spank on you. No. How, how do you do it? You talk to them, don't you? You begin to have a conversation with them. Verse 26 of chapter 1, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again, Philippians 1, 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, he's going to rebuke them here. Now, pay attention how he does it. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the, cross, of the gospel. What's he just reminded them of? All that stuff in Ephesians. All the ones in the Ephesians and the, hey, get on, make sure you're on the doctrine, guys, because I want to hear that you're on the doctrine. And the next verse, not and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. You know what was happening at Philippi? They were terrified by their adversaries. They were not operating as adults in the doctrine of Ephesians, which is here. But he doesn't bend them over his knee and start railing on them. Boy, the Galatians, look at what he did with the Galatians. Woo! That's the teenagers right there, man. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm, fa I'm worried about you. I'm scared of you. <laughs> my labor's in vain. At the end of the Galatians, I always get a chuckle. He says, you see what large a letter I wrote to you? And uh, he only wrote six chapters to them. It's like, a large letter? I figured, you know how an email, when you're yelling at somebody, it's all caps? You remember that? I think he wrote it in all caps. He's yelling at them. Ah! You know, okay? But look at what he did to these guys. He just reminds them about who they are, about striving together in the faith of the gospel. Chapter 2, he reminds them in verse 3, three there of, Let, let's esteem each other better than ourselves. See, that just that little hand that you deal with an adult. And my point is, and come over to Titus, is when you're growing through this, you're in some marks of maturity. And the marks of maturity, faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. If you look at Titus 2, the hope, in verse 13, well, start in verse 11, because here it is. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There's our faith, isn't it? Faith in the shed blood at Calvary. There he is. Teaching us the grace of God. Not only has he has salvation appeared to all men, now he's going to teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's the labor of love. 
There's that life empowered by gratitude. We're going to go and live for Him because, man, look at what He's done for me, for us. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Wow, man, we have faith. We got the Word of God. We believe the Word of God. That brings into us a labor, an understanding of a hope that we've received one day. We're going to get this new body. We're going to be positioned in the heavenly places. We we see the event we call the rapture, and as it takes us home, we have that great reunion in the sky, that meeting in the sky where we see our loved ones of old, and we, we see people we've never met before. I hope you never think you're all there is to this. You realize there's people all over this world that preach and teach the same thing you and I do that don't know about us and we don't know about them. We'll meet them one day. We'll rejoice with them. You come back there to Philippians 3. Might as well stay in Philippians 3. Well, no, you better not. (laughs) Psych. Verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Boy, there's so much going on there. Take three, four hours to get it all out of there. He's he's got a purpose to subdue all things all that governmental structure out there in heaven and in earth, and he's going to use you and I to take care of the heavenly places out there one day. Boy, what a cosmic plan he's got. Boy, you want to talk about space invaders. Woo, there it comes. You want to talk about Star Wars or Star Trek or any of that stuff. There we are. And he says, you participate in it. And you walk around with your bottom lip stuck so low you trip over it sometime. You ought not ever have a bad day. And the moment you do have a bad day, instantly go, you know what? Thank you, Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, over there, he he says, what an interesting little thing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus' concern. In everything. Not for everything, but in everything. What? Give thanks. Why? Because we know what he's doing. Look at what he's done for me. Look at when he put me in the Christ and and the operation of God happens. Boy, look at that. He says, man, there you are. There it is. I loved you. Five times, Paul says, and he gave himself for it. And the it's the body. He gave himself. He goes over there in Ephesians 5 with the husbands. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved and gave himself for it. Boy, what a standard. What a high mark. What a weighty thing. When you contemplate what he did for the church, what he did for his body. You got faith. That faith is going to produce a charity, a labor, a movement, an action. Motivated by the love of Christ constraining you because we got a hope. And this dastardly present evil world, having no hope is not a good place to be. All you got to do is watch the evening news. That's all. But man, having a hope, wow, it sustains you. Now come over to Colossians. You can stick something in Philippians, and I'm sure we'll be back. Colossians 3. I want to look at something with you about this issue of charity. Because 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 said, faith, hope, and charity. But he said the greatest of these is what? Charity. Okay. Okay? Charity. Look at Colossians 3. We'll start in verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Boy, there's our identity. (laughs) Just kind of sucked in a couple verses for you. 
We're going to set our affections on things. We're going to seek out the Word of God, seek out what God's doing, and we're going to set our affections on what He's doing. And what He's doing is, is He's got your life hid in Him, and when He shows up, you're going to glory with Him. And boy, there's the whole plan right there. Now watch the next verse. Mortify, oh, really? Come on, Paul. You just blew a happy time. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify, subdue, restrain, get them under some control. When he talks about members, he's talking about you and your flesh. Then he gives a whole list, fornication, uncleanliness, or inordinate affection, evil. Boy, you could spend a lifetime looking at all that. The end of that verse, though, I want you to catch. And covetousness, which is what? Oh, I don't believe in idolatry. I don't have idolatry. Boy, I sure would like that new Chevy pickup truck over there. Woo-wee. What does that verse say? Covetousness is what? Idolatry. Because what, what, what then begins to run your life? Well, let's see. I got it. six months of payment. I can make that. I can put enough cash in the bank. Dave Ramsey says I got to have cash, and I can go buy that thing. And, ooh, boy. and then as soon as you buy it, you know what's going to happen? It's going to break down. It'll break down the day after the warranty runs out. Then you're going to sit there, oh, and now what is it doing? It's consuming everything, isn't it? He says, knock it off. From Verse 6, from which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Ain't nothing new, folks. You've been there. You know that. You understand that. Now watch verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. Okay, thanks, Paul. Anger, wrath, malice, blaspheme, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Now, verse 5, 6, and 7 are sins of activity. Verse 8 and 9 are sins of attitude. And you got to need an attitude adjustment here. You know, old BA, bad attitude. Get an adjustment here. How do you... Make the adjustment. Verse 10, you put off the old man, and then you put on the new man. You have an adjustment in your thinking process about who you really are. Now watch verse 10 carefully. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You see that renewed in the knowledge? Don't we know a few verses that say renew your mind daily? Renew the inner man day by day? So what are you doing? You can't get rid of the old dude. He's here. But what you can do is say, well, listen, my identity, Romans 6, is that I've been freed from that guy. He has no control over me unless I give him the control to have over me. So I'm going to come over here and focus in on who I am in Christ and have that be where... You follow that? Verse 11, whether there's there's neither Jew or Greek nor Jew, Circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Sith, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect. See, now we're going to go get dressed. We took all that garbage off. Now let's go get dressed. And we're going to put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, look at what he just told you. You put off the sins of activity and attitude. Get rid of that stuff. Put on all this stuff. Kindness, forgiveness, forbearance, humble, humble boy, humbleness of mind. Some of y'all struggle with that. Woo. Meekness, long-suffering. He says, man, put on that. Let's move that into your thinking. But watch 14 carefully. And above all this, how can you get any bigger than that? Boy, what a list. What a, what a place to spend your time thinking about. And he says, above all this, put on Charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Maturity. Charity. Love in action. The labor of love. Work, love that worketh by faith, he says to the Galatians. Motivated out of a proper motivation of, 
of, of a faith understanding of what God's doing, of an understanding that I got a hope out there, so I'm not trying to work to get a hope. I've got the hope, and now I'm going to come over here and by love serve one another. And I'm going to come into an understanding of, hey, you know what's going to bring some maturity? That's that perfectness. It's this bond that we all have. Now, you know, what a, you know what a bond is, don't you? It's not the $1,000 thing you need to be a notary. Bond is like monkey glue, where you go, and you go, bam, and it can never come apart. Bond, charity, is the bond. It's what ties the Christian life together. It's the glue that holds it all together for you. But it's also the glue that holds all of us together. Okay? The bond of perfectness, perfectness, maturity. Charity is what holds the mature saints together. Whether it's yourself, and then when we come together. That's fantastic. Come over to 2 Timothy 3. Quickly now. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Now we go back to page 1. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for what? For doctrine. Remember that? We talked about doctrine. Doctrine. For reproof, for correction. You with me? These make up the instruction in righteousness. That, the purpose, the reason why Scripture is designed to do this, the reason why you start here and work your way up, you don't start here and work your way down. Doesn't work. The reason you're going to do it God's way, that, the intent, the purpose, the reason, is that the man of God may be perfect. Perfect is defined for you in the verse, comma, truly furnished unto all good works. Perfect. You're able to do what? The good works that are needed to be done. You have the foundation laid in. Now come back to Philippians 3. You have the foundation laid in. You have the the work of faith going. You've got the Word of God. It's working in your life. It's empowering your life because you believe it. And that moves you into a labor of love and of charity and of a thinking of, hey, now I have a life of gratitude and I can go serve others now. Because I'm sustained by a hope out there one day that's mine, and I know it's mine. Isn't there a song? It is mine. Okay. Now look at Philippians 3. Because I want to illustrate this, and we've got five minutes and we'll be done. Look at verse 15 and verse 16 in Philippians. Philippians 3.15, let us therefore, as many as be, what? Perfect. What's perfect mean? Mature. By the way, perfect doesn't mean you don't sin anymore. Because all of you do. Okay, you have that old man. I love that thing in Galatians 5, he says, that old man, there's a war, there's a battle, causes me to do the things I shouldn't be doing. But there's a maturity. Be thus minded. So let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God will reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Those two verses are talking about relative maturity. When I started a minute ago and I said everybody in the room's at different levels, that's the verse right there. But notice what that verse instructs you and I to do as we begin to grow. Be thus minded. We got the same thinking, don't we? We're 
striving, chapter 1, verse 27, we're striving together for the work of the gospel and for the faith of the gospel, and we're moving, and we're working together for the faith of the gospel. Chapter 2, verse 5, we're let this mind be in you which is in Christ, and so forth. So we have the same thinking, don't we? Let us thus be minded. We're going to think a certain way. And you know what? And if anything, you be otherwise minded. We're not all on the same page, are we? we got, we're on the same page here. But over here, we're not on the same page. We have a deficiency. So what do we do? Throw our hands up and quit? What does the verse tell you to do? What would the mature saint do? Well, he says, God shall reveal even this unto you. How does God reveal things to you? Through the Word of God, doesn't he? So what are you going to do? Study to show thyself approved. You're going to get in a book and study. Hey, I don't understand this, man. Rick, he said this the other day. I don't get it. I, well, all right, well, let's get in there, Rick. Where do you said this one? Let's talk. And what, what are we going to do? We're going to get in the book. Nevertheless, verse 16, whereunto we have already attained. We have this component down. In Philippi, you know what they understood? They understood that Christ died for their sins. They had been taught about the body, the church, the body of Christ, why God's doing what God's doing. They had been exposed to the hope and the glory that's coming out there in the future. They, and you know what they said? We got this down. We are striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're not going to let that go. Verse 16. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. You know what we're not going to do? We're not going to get this, but we're going to be working to get that. Follow me? Follow that? We're here. We've got the foundation laid, but we're going to be working to get there. Once we got that, we're not going to let that go either. And we're going to work to get there. And that understanding. And once we got the doctrine of, our, of the glory and the coming and him and, and so forth, then we're not going to let that go. And then after this, by the way, you got a whole book of Tim, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon about the congregation, about the local assembly. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to learn about that. And we ain't going to let any of it go. And we're going to be participating in a local assembly that holds to that edification process. And if I'm in a local assembly and they don't do what Paul tells me to do, I'm out of here. Follow that? That's, that's maturity. That's looking at the situation, saying, hey, what's their gospel message? What do you know it to be? Christ died for your sins. Faith in Him and Him alone, resting and trusting in Him exclusively. No one else. All right, we're good there. Now, who do they say we are? Well, you're the spiritual Israel. And we're bringing in a kingdom. And thanks for playing. Who are you? You're a, you're a saint of the Most High God. You're a member of the church, the body of Christ. You got a heavenly goal. Let's learn about that. How am I getting there? Well, one day Christ will come back to the earth and you'll be here and he'll just resurrect you right on into the kingdom. And thanks for playing that game. No. He's going to come back with a shout, with a voice, with a trump. We're going to meet him in the air, go through that judgment seat of Christ. He's going to present us to the Father. The Father then will take us and set us into our heavenly places. Romans 12, he says over there, those that are dwell in heaven, rejoice, for the kingdom of heaven is, at, is there. Rejoice. Boy, we're going to be rejoicing. <clears throat> Just so you don't think I'm getting any more, you got godliness. But until all that comes to fruition, we got a life to live that's to be a lived a godlike life. Which, by the way, brings in the issue of the fellowship. And if you were with us yesterday, we talked about it in the men's meeting, the fellowship of the mystery. That's spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is not meeting in a small group 
on Thursday nights to get things done, to go through a little book, booklet. That's not spiritual maturity, folks. That's the treadmill of religion that's got you just doing something so that they can get you to do something. Spiritual maturity isn't coming to church. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian just as much as going to a garage makes you a car. Just That's a joke. I have to tell him up front here when I'm joking, okay? He's a little slow, okay? <laughs> See, folks, spiritual maturity is saying, you know what? I want to go to church because I want to know and I want to grow. And I want to move from baby to adult. I don't want to be down here. You know what they feed baby? Baby food. Blech. I want that prime rib, bone in, fully loaded sweet potato with the wedge, blue cheese wedge salad and the steak and bacon ma macaroni and cheese. Oh, yeah. Then I have the belly ache later. But right then, oh, boy. Get that old ribeye going, and it's just drool. Oh, yeah. Why? Because that's what you feed adults. Right? All right. So the marks of spiritual maturity, the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. Faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these are charity. Why is it the greatest? Because it's what bonds us together. It's what keeps us together. And that's what we need. We need each other far more than what I think sometimes we realize because of the present evil world. And you know what? It's always good to come around people you know that are on your side. You might not always agree with them, but you know what? They're on your side. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we just thank you for everything that we have in you, for the all spiritual blessings, for the completeness but also for the ability, the equipping that you've given to us to be able to say, it's not I, but Christ. And the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In your name we pray. Amen.